Welcome to another weekend bonus episode of the Tech Meme Ride Home. I'm Brian McCullough, and it's a big one, everyone. The founder and CEO of a company that we talk about all the time, Brian Seleski of Argo AI joins us today. Brian tells us more about the unique Silicon Valley slash Detroit hybrid that Argo represents. We discuss the unique business model and strategy that Argo is exploring. And we find out where the self-driving space is now that COVID-19 has basically put everything on pause. Brian, I, I really need to start with the most uh, pressing question at this moment in time because the um, in terms of what I've covered on this podcast recently <laughs> in this space has been, um, you know, basically everything I've heard is that in terms of the actual research and, you know, on the road testing and things like that, um, everybody in the industry has had to put that on pause. So I'm, I'm just, if I could get a sense of for you all, if, if that's true, is everything on pause? Like what, what is the state of your uh, work at the moment? Yeah, uh, it's a good question. We've been, off the road since around middle of March, uh, when it became clear that um, you know the right thing to do is to is to go ahead and quarantine and and uh, you know we we were we were very proactive as a company to uh, we want we always want to prioritize the health and safety of our people and and uh, it was clear that this was you know the world was gonna was gonna change from that point forward we didn't know how long and. Um, but it was going to change. So we, we shut down our, a lot of our vehicle operations that were on the road. A lot of those people ended up uh, uh, working from home, actually, and helping us with a number of other types of activities. Um, and they continue to do so. Uh, so we're here towards the end of May, and we're just now starting to see vehicles be able to go back on the road in, in some cities, not all of them. So that is that was going to be my next question. Uh, for, for how long are you going to be on pause? But you're you're like like everything else. Seemingly, you guys are starting to slowly uh, get the gears back going. We're slowly getting back. Um, we've been able to to resume in a very limited way in uh, in DC and here in in Pittsburgh. Here in Pittsburgh, we actually were tapped on the shoulder by the Allegheny County Health Department. They needed some help. Uh, transporting test samples uh, for them to be flown out to a laboratory in California for processing. Mm. And they, they said, hey, we need to get to a bunch of locations in a sort of fast amount of time, bring them all back, and they need to get on a plane by a certain time each day. And we said, sure, yeah, let's do it. And it was a great way to um, you know, combine what we're doing and also, um, also help out the community. Well, I've heard in, in, in the interim, um, other folks have been saying they've just been doing everything they can in simulation and, and, and such like that. But it, it, is that just a placeholder? Like, has this, to what degree has this pause setback timelines and, and things like that for, for you guys? Like, I, I assume there's only so much that can be done in simulation that, like, the real meat of everything is when you're actually on real roads in the real world. Yes, simulation can only get you so far. The answer is an and, you need both. Um, a shutdown for a couple of months is not really that big of a deal. We had, uh, we had been operating for several years now at this point across many different cities. Uh, all that data that we had brought back, we're able to use in simulation and, and get, you know, we're able to, to, um, we're able to get a lot of value out of that. So our team has continued to be productive. They're writing software, testing and simulation, testing against our uh, both real world and simulated data. Um, and that helps give us confidence in the software that's been written in the, over the last, you know, eight weeks or so, six, six to eight weeks. I would say that, that you can't do that indefinitely though. So I am thankful that we're able to get back on the road. I think we're all anxious to see, you know, what the performance is um, as we put it on our test track to see um, kind of how it compares to what we were seeing in simulation. It'll be, it'll be actually pretty informative because we've never had a shutdown this long. So this will be interesting. But so it, it does sound, it sounds good in the sense that it's not like you're saying, oh, oh, we had to throw out all of our metrics for this year because of this couple month no. pause, but yeah. Okay. No, and I and, and, and our t if anything, we're we're uh, we're sticking to the plan this year. We're, we've told the team they know what they need to hit. Um, we we reprioritize some work in order to um, 
that, that lends itself better to simulation. Uh, uh, but you know, at the end of the day, the work's got to get done. We're going to get through it. So I've been really excited to, to talk to you because, um, in my opinion, like y'all are the, one of the more interesting stories in this space because it, you know, I, I, I come from tech. Uh, I, I actually lived in Detroit for, for five years in the early two thousands. And I was the weirdo tech guy among all these car guys. And, (laughs) and, and what I love about your, because the narrative has always sort of been like, for this technology, there's the Silicon Valley approach, and then there's the Detroit approach, and like who is going to win out in the end? And and I feel like, you know, both both of the both sides have their strengths and weaknesses in terms of getting this technology out the door and and ultimately doing something that will have an impact on the real world. But I feel like your story is really like kind of a best of both worlds story, and and you you've done the stints in the Valley, you've been at Waymo, you know, you're in Pittsburgh and, and Detroit. And so I'm curious on, on your take on the different cultures, at least when it comes to tackling this problem, this engineering problem. Sure. I, I certainly did my tour of duty out West. Uh, I've also, you know, done quite a bit here in, in Pittsburgh and Detroit. And, um, Certainly, there are there are differences. Uh, the weather chief among them, <laughs> mm. but beyond that, I th- I think that what I've actually found is a lot of common common ground in that a lot of the folks that work for us are very mission oriented. They're mission driven. They're they're driven by the idea that there's a there's a better way to operate vehicles that addresses the safety um, the safety issues around human based driving and I think especially in in, in more cha- in the challenging miles that there are to drive and uh, I found that that folks in the valley versus here it's no difference if you're mission oriented and you're doing and you're you know you want to be part of this there's really no difference. Um, Certainly, there is a little bit of, um, I think people come from different backgrounds uh, a little bit. I, I, I find a lot of folks that are in Pittsburgh or Detroit, I think they've got uh, a little more of maybe an appreciation for the the auto industry and kind of what it means to take, you know, to, to manufacture really big, complex things at, at at, at a, a heck of a scale. I mean, I mean, a lot of folks don't understand that, you know, modern auto manufacturing, that's taking 30,000 parts and putting it together in an awfully complex system. There's quite a bit that goes into that, right? Um, I, think, I think folks that are like in and around that industry probably just appreciate it maybe a little bit more just because they've seen it, they understand it, they've had family that can I can I interrupt you? Yeah, <laughs> because yeah. there was recently this this Wired piece that uh, was partially a profile of you, interview of you, and like there's an anecdote in there about I can't remember what it was, but like uh, some sort of demo car where engineers are trying to throw a bunch of like electronics in the trunk, but then like some car guy comes along and is like, you know, by the way, a key component of the the crash performance of that particular model is in is in the uh, the spare tire in the trunk. So yeah, this don't is take that. like and, and you, your your quote was something like, "We'll see." Uh, you know, software engineers wouldn't have known that. Yeah, that's right. I mean, it's and this is probably not so much the case now where they're taking spare tires out of cars, right? They, they put the fix a flat stuff or whatever in there now, but mm-hmm. um, but at the time for that particular make model car, the spare tire did have. Uh, you know, does add to the ability to absorb energy in, in the, in the, in the rear crash worthiness of the car. And, and it's one of those things that if, if you're, if you're just sort of trying to, to prove a concept, that's maybe fine. But when it comes to shipping a product, you have to, um, you have to think through those things. That's right. Well, so, I mean, I, we're kind of being a little jokey about this, but in a larger sense, you know, and I, and I was joking about being a, a tech guy in Detroit, 20 years ago, but then there's also been, I've been telling for years, my Silicon Valley people, like, you know, th- it's not just an intellectual problem that you're trying to solve. Like, and, 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 you know, automakers as an industry have a century's worth of unique sets of skills that can get this technology to reality, right? 
Um, so am I right in, in my sense of Argo as that like you're trying to marry at least from not just a cultural, but even from a strategic perspective, like both sides of that to, to solve this problem? Yeah, look, this, what's fascinating about robotics in general and, and what really got me into it is, is how it really requires teamwork and people from all different uh, walks of life and disciplines to put these things together and to think through um, all the different important attributes and, and what the right way, you know, to find the right solution. I, I find that, that uh, it's some of the most fascinating and, and rewarding um, design sessions that you have is when you've got um, a mechanical engineer, an electrical engineer, a software engineer, a technician, um, a mechanic. W- when you when you put all of those people with all of their ex- extensive experiences and knowledge base together, you can really come up with some very neat solutions. Um, this sort of multidisciplinary thinking um, is hard to find in other companies, just because. A lot of times you don't need all of that uh, to right. Sometimes you, if it's just if you're building a pure software product, you just don't get exposure. Um, but what's cool about this industry is you need all, you need all of the above. Data is the transformative energy of the modern enterprise. But why is transformation in business so hard? It's because the disorder of data and systems can conspire to impede your execution. TIBCO helps customers unlock the value of their real-time data to create a comprehensive asset for smarter, faster decision-making. For customers like Panera Bread, that meant unifying their data so they could quickly launch Panera Bread Grocery and diversify their business during the quarantine. For T-Mobile, working with TIBCO meant being able to handle 10 times the usual traffic to their website for iPhone pre-orders. TIBCO can do things like this for your enterprise too, reliably and seamlessly. TIBCO loves nothing better than seeing the leadership their customers attain when TIBCO empowers their design, development, and analytics teams to solve their most challenging problems. With more than 14 leadership positions from top industry analysts, including Gartner and Forrester, TIBCO's role in the digital economy is pervasive and unparalleled. Learn more about how TIBCO can unlock the value of your company's real-time data at tibco.com slash ride. That's T-I-B-C-O dot com slash ride. Have you looked at your wireless bill lately? Chances are you're paying too much. It's 2020. Network coverage is better than ever, no matter who your wireless provider is. So why pay more for the same service? That's where Mint Mobile comes in. They can cut your bill down to 15 bucks a month for the same premium coverage. I know what you're thinking. That's probably too good to be true. But these guys know what they're doing. Your old wireless bill pays for expensive retail stores and overhead, while Mint Mobile reimagined how you buy wireless and made it all online, passing the savings directly onto you. It's the same coverage. My Mint Mobile line sounds identical to my wife's incumbent wireless line. Every Mint Mobile plan comes with unlimited nationwide talk and text, plus crazy fast 4G LTE. Use your own phone with any Mint Mobile plan and keep your same phone number along with all your existing contacts. And if you're not 100% satisfied, Mint Mobile has you covered with their 7-day money-back guarantee. There's literally no reason not to give Mint Mobile a try. To get your new wireless plan for just 15 bucks a month and get the plan shipped to your door for free, go to mintmobile.com slash ride. That's mintmobile.com slash ride. Cut your wireless bill down to 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash ride. So another thing that I respect about uh, y'all and, and your model is that, um, you know, you, you've been more open about uh, questioning, like, you're saying this is so new, we, we don't know necessarily at the beginning what the business model is for this. And then late last year, you started to come out and started to answer that question, which for you guys, and, and I'm going to simplify here, is, is essentially to use like a tech analogy is you're going to be the platform. You're going to charge for, per mile and you're going to allow other people to create whatever business models on top of that as they can. Is that, is that, am I oversimplifying or is that generally what, what you, you guys have settled on at this point? No, I think that's right. And and certainly there's a lot of different ways in which that can be done. It doesn't even necessarily need to be per mile. But I mm-hmm. think the idea that it is uh, there's unit economics around this where 
um, you don't need to to own this really expensive asset that sits you know ninety some percent of the time in a driveway or in a parking lot that that there's a different way to still get personal mobility um, without owning a vehicle, I think is super powerful and, and is where you're going to see some of the first applications and deployments of self-driving cars. And you're happy with uh, your partners so far, you know, Ford and, Ford and Volkswagen as, you know, 100-year-old and more automakers. What you just described is not owning a, an expensive asset. That's like a fundamental change in their business model for a century. Um, you're happy with their uh, willingness to explore these alternatives that this might entail. Oh, absolutely. I mean, they, they've been wonderful. I couldn't ask for, for better partners. And, and I think that the thing folks need to understand is that um, they don't, by and large, it's challenging for any automaker, any automaker to sell large volumes of vehicles in the middle of a city just because there's so many incentives and it's only getting worse but there's so many incentives not to own, right? Everything from parking to taxes, insurance, and so on, it's quite expensive. And so this is really just a natural progression of things that, um, you know, uh, these many of these automakers, especially ones that have been around for a long time, they've had to go through many transformations. I think this is just one in a, in a, long, a long line of them. Um. When I, uh, I started this show two and a half years ago, and, and every time I would do a, autonomous vehicle segment i would sort of have this running joke that like uh the, the wager is we'll see self-driving cars on real roads in a real way by 2020 because that's what i had always heard for the last five years or so and and i know that generally in the industry that's sort of you know by necessity that's sort of been tamped down a bit recently and of course the covid situation is is um changing that as well. So I'm not going to ask you when you think that my bet is going to pay off. Thank you. But yes, yeah. <laughs> let me let me ask you you this way when you started not Argo, but when you started in this technology um did you assume that by 2020 like a lot of other people that we'd be further along than we are now? No, I I never I was never really sure. You got to remember I came into this um, not so much as a diehard roboticist, but as a as a software engineer that came out of a diff, totally different industry that was kind of interested. I wanted to learn more, um, but I think I was always a little bit of a, a skeptic in the in the earlier days. I'm not anymore, obviously. I mean, I I think it's it's no longer if it's it really is a question of when. But um, you know, in 2004, the world was very very different. That's when I got got my start at, at Carnegie Mellon. It, it, and what was what was interesting to me was, I mean, it just sounded almost inconceivable that that you could even make something like this work to me, somebody who didn't get a PhD in robotics, and I'm surrounded by PhDs, right? I'm surrounded by people who have already had uh, anywhere from five to eight years of experience in this, if not more, um, uh, and and in, in some cases, people who already had 15, 20 years of experience doing auto- automation. And it was really eye-opening for me at um, how little in 2004 actually really worked very well. <laughs> um, it, it, and, and, and I realized there was I realized early on that there was a long road to travel. And I actually thought that the first deployments was really going to be some sort of driver assistance that would make use of a lot of the, the, um, the, the AI techniques we were using then. Um, and it turns out that that actually has its own set of issues, right? And, and, and I believe the path we're on is, is the right one, but it's going to take some time for us to get there. And that path is full self-driving, no, no involvement uh, from, from a human. Um, right. I, I've heard that from other folks, which is that uh, instead of just doing like some super cruise control or whatever, a lot of people <laughs> realized at the same time that you can't go half measure. You got to go full measure. It's not going to work. You got to you got to solve the problem entirely before you even try to deploy it. Yeah, and I th- I think there's a world for for both. the The thing that you can't count on so much is that a human is going to be paying attention all the time mm-hmm. uh, from from a um, fr- from a uh, fr- let me let me say that part again. Um, sure. The the thing that you you can't count on is for a human to be involved in another task like reading email something else and then it'd be expected to come back and in a matter of of just a very short time span a fraction of a second a second 
be able to then resume control of the vehicle. Cause you have to get, you have to regain some sort of situational awareness of what's around the car. Right. Um, it, that, that's, that particular state is, is a very difficult challenge to solve. I'm not going to call it impossible because I've learned mm-hmm. in my career that, you know, there's always a potential solution out there, but you know, there's really a stark contrast. And I think the industry needs to get better with the vocabulary and be more precise, right? That there is, there are systems that you must pay attention all the time uh, and, and monitor the system, or it is the system takes over for you within some sort of area uh, that it's able to operate in. It's, it's one or the other, that in-between state where you can check out for moments of time, but then the system has to re-engage you. That's the hard part. That's really hard. And I, and I, think, I think back in 04, uh, I, you know, we didn't know enough to the, the, that that was going to be problematic. Well, and that lines up with what I've heard from other people on the show too, which is that, and, and correct me if I'm wrong from your perspective, that the biggest thing right now still holding back this technology is the human element in the sense that like, you know, if you could, contr- if you could construct a perfectly closed system, Like the algorithms can handle that or whatever, but it's the fact that there's pedestrians that don't cross at crosswalks, that there's, you have to be aggressive and nudge your way into traffic. Sometimes it's the, it's the fact that we still will have for the foreseeable future, human actors in the equation, that that's the thing that is the hardest nut to crack still. That's right. And and just put simply, how do you, how do you know what's going to happen three, four, five, six seconds from now? That's, Mm -hmm that's really difficult to do. Now it turns out that as humans, we have evolved to become really incredible predictive systems. We are able to anticipate from small little movements, whether somebody's paying attention or about, or or, are a little bit um, antsy and want to jump out. Right. Uh, Even though it's not their turn to, to maybe go into a crosswalk as humans, we pick up on very subtle cues and the challenge is how do we get a computer to do the same thing? And the good news is that in the last several years, I think we have techniques to do it, but it takes a huge amount of data to um, sort of train these algorithms so that they're accurate enough to be effective. Well, that's, I, I had uh, Gary Marcus on, on here, um, the AI researcher and his whole big thing. I don't know if you know him is that AI hasn't developed real common sense yet. Um, and that sort of sounds like the same thing is that like what you're describing is thinking, it, intuiting what would happen six seconds from now, you can't know like a computer wants the perfect information to make a decision but common sense is i have enough information to make a reasonable decision yeah that's well said that's right um so is that another holy grail for cracking this is just giving (laughs) giving these cars some sort of common sense well we we like we like hard problems uh i I, you know there's also the saying that common sense is not that common (laughs) Mm, mm -hmm. well Um, i mean listen it's not like human beings, even, even human beings with this common sense don't seem so smart sometimes yeah. when you're out on the road with them. Well, this, this, is, this is absolutely solvable with, with what we know how to do today. Uh, the, the, just the challenge, though, is that it requires, uh, it requires a lot of examples. And when I say example, um, what I mean is it, re- it requires presenting the software with a lot of different um, uh, versions or, or scenarios of you know, people and bikes and other things in around uh, in and around the car doing different things uh, in order to refine this this prediction algorithm, and and that's why is kind of going full circle now in our discussion. But that's why road testing is so important. Is you know you can only simulate that to a certain extent on on a test track. Uh, you really want to get the the real world examples because there's just going to be so much more variation. Here's why I've been a Tavala fan and religious user for nine months now. It's just after noon, and today for lunch, I had curried sweet potato tacos with sweet pea rice and mint cilantro chutney. This was delivered as part of my weekly six meals yesterday. It was only 680 calories, and yet, unlike my experience with other meal services, it was completely filling. And while it took 17 minutes to cook, it only took me 30 seconds to prep. I took the tray out of the refrigerator, slotted it in the Tavala oven, scanned the barcode, and boom, it steamed, baked, and broiled it to perfection. 
Tavala is a smart oven. It does all of the things for you. You just scan and cook and then eat. No other prep than that. Tavala saves you time, saves you from eating processed food because it's all fresh stuff, saves you from an expensive takeout habit. If you want to try Tavala out for yourself, you can get a 100-day trial with free and easy returns. And right now, Tavala is offering listeners to this show $50 off their purchase. So if you combine that with the $100 off you get when you sign up for six weeks of meal deliveries, you get a total of $150 off getting started with Tavala. To get this exclusive deal, text Tavala Ride, all one word, to 71023. That's Tavala Ride, T O V A L A R I D E, to 71023. Is it one of those things where it's like that weird tipping point where um, you can't get the you can't get these robots out on the road in in a large scale until you've got it as good as you can possibly get it. But once you get it out there, and so then you, there will be millions of miles driven every day. That then, as soon as that can happen, like this system will perfect itself like overnight. Yeah, I think that's. I think that 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 the scale helps, but at the end of the day. Um, the data that comes back still needs to be handled with some amount of manual care. Um, it's not like this thing becomes a, a, a an all-knowing being and learns on its own as you feed it millions of miles every night. Um, it, it still requires curation. It still requires analysis. It still requires a lot of validation uh, to make sure that the that it's learning the right thing. Um, so, you know, oftentimes there's this like fallacy out there that, you need billions of miles in order to um, in order to train these things, and and you know the, that if if you just had a fleet of of millions of test cars, you could you could build the algorithm tomorrow, and it it really doesn't work that way because hmm. of that time and care that's still involved. So there, there's actually the opposite effect. You could actually drown yourself in data and slow yourself down. It's about getting the right data, the right set of variations that's really powerful. That's an interesting idea that someone just turned me on to recently, and it was about this concept that. Um, a lot of algorithms have been broken recently by the COVID moment because our behaviors have been so outside the norms. Yeah, absolutely. (laughs) The algorithms are, are, you know, throwing their hands up in the air. So that makes me think like, is there a potential scenario where even when AI uh, autonomous vehicles are on the road in a major way, like even 30 or 50 years from now, like that will be a job. There will still be engineers somewhere Hundred percent. That will always be tweaking stuff. Yeah, to- totally. We're always going to be improving and, and tweaking things, and and there'll always be another mile to to map, to test on, to understand. Um, and but you're totally right. I mean, on the COVID thing, that's really interesting insight. But it's true, right? We've 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 sort of tripped the 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 circuit breaker on like every single model because the behavior is completely changed. I mean, look at the supply chain; it's totally right. turned upside down. The the endpoints. Are are more and more distributed. It's not businesses. It's it's homes now, right? As everybody's working from home, living at home full time, uh, it, it isn't. It was never wired to do that from the beginning, and so everybody's having to adapt. I'll be honest with you. I mean, I look at what's happening, and and uh, it's incredible how well we have adapted, isn't it? Mm-hmm, I mean, I think mm-hmm. it really is. Well, not only you know the supply chains haven't broken down as much as they could have. Right. The, the internet hasn't broken down seemingly at all. But, it, you know, the, the, the key of that is, is that the, the system was optimized for the paradigm that we had for, I don't know, at least a decade. And so when you're talking about things like supply chains, it's a matter of you have to design your systems in a way, not just for black swans, but to allow for, yes, you can optimize for efficiency that'll be efficient 99% of the time, but then you're going to lose a ton of money if you can't also optimize for that 30%, you know, anomaly or that 90% anomaly, you know, that sort of thing. That's right. And, and, and with self-driving, 80% of our work is, is dealing with the black swans. Right. Um, all right. This last question is, is way out of left field. And so <laughs> if it's, if it doesn't hit, I might even completely cut it. But, um, I recently got turned on to that, um, 
that Denzel Washington movie, Unstoppable, about uh, that, uh, that that runaway train. Yeah, I've seen that. It's a good movie. Yeah. <laughs> well, so when I was researching you, like you early on worked at Switch and Signal, which is Switch and Signal. Yep. So, so like your whole job was co- like controlling that sort of dark territory, like those stretches of track that aren't governed by signal systems. Yeah. So we managed systems that kept track of. Um, kind of where where those things were uh they call them uh sort of permits if i remember because it's a long time ago but mm-hmm. you, you uh but 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 absolutely yeah i mean it, it was these massive command centers that had uh visibility into railroad operations where it was lit up so to speak but also where it was uh where it was dark where there was no equipment and so you had to keep track of that stuff very diligently in the in the command center So number one, my question would be, uh, did you feel like that movie? I mean, obviously it's an action movie. It's a, it's a popcorn movie or whatever, but did did they get at least the, the reality of, of managing trains a little right? I I think they did from a, from a crisis management, incident management perspective, um, I mean, obviously, it's, everything's d- dramatized and exaggerated for for movie like effect. But mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. but 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 there are command centers that are very similar to what you see in that movie. And um, and in fact, the first project I worked on was actually for the Port Authority uh, in Allegheny County here in Pittsburgh to revamp their control system for our version of a of a subway, which is called the T. And um, it was just uh, it was a fascinating experience because you realized just. Uh, just how important software is in in areas that you just never really thought about, right? As, a, mm-hmm. as an average kind of consumer, there's so many mission critical uh, systems that run out there that that uh, you know software is absolutely essential. And so, it certainly served as a good foundation for what I do now. Well, that was my second question. What was in essence uh, that problem? That intellectual problem is that what you've been doing ever since? Just like blown up into infinity. Oh, oh, for sure. Yeah. I, I, you know, I, I joked around with a colleague here with the quarantine, I've had an opportunity to get a lot of time back in my life cause I'm not traveling anywhere. So I actually have been, uh, I've actually been doing some stuff in Python, uh, a little bit of programming and like little things that, and, and I, and I realize I'm having a lot of satisfaction from it because, uh, this is actually something that totally has no, like, safety or mission criticality mm-hmm. to it the stuff that i'm doing it, it has nothing to do really do with the self-driving system so i'm thinking wow this is this is a pleasure it's a nice change of pace i've never had to, i've never had this luxury before <laughs> well another word for that brian is fun <laughs> yes yeah, well i think it's all it's all fun but yeah uh, well conse- uh, consequence free fun maybe as well. yeah that's right uh brian thank you so much thank you it was great being here 